And I give the call to the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to move that all words in paragraph A of Sessional Order 65A be omitted and the following words substituted. A. During question time, priority shall be given to a crossbench member seeking the call on the 5th, 13th and 17th questions. Is leave granted? In terms of the government, leave is granted. It is not granted. I call the member for Goldstein. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Goldstein from moving the following motion immediately. That all words in paragraph A of sessional order 65A be omitted and the following words substituted. During question time, priority shall be given to a crossbench member seeking the call on the 5th, 13th and 17th questions. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call, is, the, is the motion seconded? Oh. Does the member for Goldstein wish to speak to the motion? I call the member for Goldstein. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the urgency of this matter to justify suspension of standing orders is as follows. The intention of the sessional orders agreed at the beginning of the 47th parliament was that the crossbench get three questions each question time in line with increased crossbench representation. Even in the short period parliament has been sitting, this is not the way that question time has developed. This is urgent because now in five of the seven question times so far during this parliament, the crossbench has received only two questions and only 18 questions were heard today. Each day that passes therefore reflects the denial of the opportunity to question the government on important matters relating to the community that elected this crossbench, the largest crossbench of our time. It's important, Mr Speaker, that we begin as we plan to continue in this new parliament, rather than allowing poor habits to evolve or simply turning a blind eye to deliberate mischievous points of order. It is urgent because this is denying crossbenchers the full opportunity to represent our communities in parliament in one of the few times that we get the opportunity to speak up. It is on that basis that I put this motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is the motion seconded? And I call the member for Kuyong. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move to second and support the member for Goldstein's motion for this change to sessional order 65A. This 47th parliament has the largest crossbench yet seen in this House, reflecting the fact that one third of Australians voted for a representative independent from the major parties at the most recent federal election. The millions of Australians who made up our electorates have expressed a desire for us to see politics done differently. As a new member of parliament, I've been disappointed by the opposition's frequent interruptions and stonewalling in, and stonewalling in question time in the first sitting night of this parliament. The opposition's points of order are pointless. The time that we have here is precious. It is expensive. It should be valued. We hold the trust of the public that we use this time effectively and responsibly. Our electorates want and deserve better than the time wasted in, current, in question time. We wish to facilitate a more productive question time in which the important and pressing issues of our time can be discussed in detail and with respect. This country needs an effective opposition, and question time needs to include real questions and real answers. The interests of our individual electorates will be better served by a redistribution of questions, such as to increase the ability of this crossbench to hold the government to account. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the manager of opposition business. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I informed the House that the uh, opposition became aware of this proposed suspension of standing orders around uh, 2.15 today when the member for Goldstein uh, approached me to provide me with notice of that, and I thank her for doing that. Um, the, uh, I was then informed that the uh, government uh, intends to support this. Now, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, just weeks ago, the government made changes to the standing orders uh, through, through the normal uh, process to add uh, standing order 65A, which purports to set out, or which aims to set out, a set of new and modified arrangements 
uh, to deal with the fact that we do have a different composition in this parliament than we have had previously. And of course, Section 65, uh, Standing Order 65A, amongst other things, uh, is uh, predicated on uh, the assumption that there will be, uh, when you work through the maths, uh, 22 questions, because it refers to a crossbench member seeking the call on the 5th, on the 13th and on the 21st question. Now, uh, as the member for Kuyong has rightly said, in fact today uh, the Prime Minister brought question time to an end after 18 questions. And we saw in the uh, several uh, question times in the last sitting period the Prime Minister bringing question time to an end after uh, 18 or 20 questions. So uh, we've had conduct from the government which is different to uh, the premise on which it drafted uh, Standing Order 65A, brought it to the House and secured the support of the House for it. Now, I make no criticism, Mr Speaker, of the crossbench uh, for uh, bringing this motion forward today. Uh, but what I do say is that these are matters within the control of the government and, given the conduct that we have seen from the Prime Minister today and in uh, several uh, uh, question times in the last sitting period, uh, with the Prime Minister shutting down questions after 18 or indeed 20 questions, the practical impact of what is put before the House today, let's be in no doubt about it, the practical impact will be, unless the Prime Minister changes his practices, it will mean one less question for the opposition and one more question for the uh, crossbench. And I say to the House, and I say particularly to the government, uh, this has been done. Uh, this, is, this is not an exercise of good faith by the government. The government just weeks ago set out uh, a set of arrangements in the standing orders. There were extensive discussions uh, between all of the parties, government, uh, uh, opposition, crossbench, a whole range of uh, discussions on these matters. Uh, we did raise concerns with a number of them, uh, but uh, the government set out a set of arrangements and that has now been uh, set out in the standing orders. Literally a week or two later, uh, in terms of sitting time, uh, sitting weeks that have elapsed, the government is now propo proposing, as I'm advised, to support a material change to those arrangements which have the practical effect of reducing uh, by one question the question that routinely uh, the number of questions that the uh, opposition receives and increasing by one the number of questions that the crossbench receives. Again, I make no criticism of the crossbench. I do criticise the government. This is, uh, this is uh, not the way that uh, the government should be engaging with the opposition. We've heard a lot about kinder, gentler politics. We've heard a lot about a more cooperative and consultative approach. This is the very opposite of that. This is being done with absolutely no notice to the opposition, and the practical effect, the practical effect of it is to reduce by one the number of questions that the opposition is able to ask. Now I say to the Prime Minister, I say to the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister could resolve this issue simply by committing that he will maintain a practice of having 22 questions, which is the basis on which Standing Order 65A was drafted. Uh, the opposition uh, will, oppose, will oppose this motion on the practical grounds that its substantive effect is to reduce the number of questions that we receive. And I say to the government, you could solve this issue very simply by committing to have 22 questions uh, in question time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I give the call to the leader of the to the leader of the house. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that was a valiant defence in favour of a sessional order that the opposition voted against. That's, that's what we just had. The sessional order, the manager of opposition business is right that it presumes we'll get through 22 questions, which most of the time we used to and when we got to the normal finishing time of 10 past three. What has happened this term is because the only question that they feel is at stake is the crossbench question, therefore they will take point of order after point of order, <laughs> slow everything down, slow everything down, and they don't lose a question. It's always actually been a natural restraint. 
on opposition that you would feel if you kept the points of order going, you were going to lose a question at the other end, and that would cause oppositions to hold back. On this occasion, what they've done is decided, well, it's only the crossbench that's at stake, so therefore, points of order, they'll do. We had four on one question today. Four on one question. Now, the impact, the impact of this will be really simple. If the number of points of order goes back to normal, the opposition will get all the questions that they had every right to expect. But effectively, what this change to the sessional order does is it says the commitment that was publicly given, that was publicly given to the crossbench that they would get three questions, is what will ordinarily now occur. That's what this says. And it says for the commitments that were made to the opposition, it's very much up to you. Very much up to you. There is only one reason we're getting through so, so few questions. And that's, the, that's in the hands of the manager of opposition business. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Kennedy. Mr. Speaker, when I came into this place as a member of the National Party, uh, the government, uh, in three months, in three months, I got no questions at all. Now every two or three weeks, I get a question. But when I did get the, no, listen, listen, listen. Order. When I did get the question. The whip came down and said, you got a question to Daikata, and he gave me the question. And I said, that's got nothing to do with my electorate. I'm not interested in that. What are you giving me that for? And he said, that's the question you're asking. And I said, well, hold on a minute. Do I understand the only way I get to stand up and ask questions, please, is if I'm a mouthpiece and a little puppet on a string for you? Is that the way it works? He said, yes. That's the way it works. Now, what we are asking for is a more enlightened approach than that. Um, um, now, um, question time was cut short because I had question 21, and the Prime Minister was a bit scared of it. I know that, but he's a good bloke. He's a good bloke. He's a good bloke. Um, Peter Andron and Ted Mack, the fathers of the third force in politics. They said on their first re-election, the first time a third party person had ever got re-elected, they said the only questions that will be asked in this place will be asked by us, the three of us on the cross benches, because they are the only meaningful questions. One side throws banana skins in front of the government and the government tells us how wonderful they are. Which bores the entire Australian public silly, and I want to thank both of them because that's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we're here. Now, it sure would be nice if we gave a bit of return on their money to the taxpayers of Australia. Order. The, the question is that the a motion be agreed to. I'll put the question. This is to suspend standing. Does all those with opinion say aye? Aye. Against no? I think the ayes have it. No's have, have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order block the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Werriwa and Bean as tellers for the ayes and the honourable members for Gray and Parks as tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 87, noes 53. The result is carried by an absolute majority of members as required by Standing Order 47 and therefore resolved in the affirmative. And I give the call to the member for Goldstein. Move that all words in paragraph A of Sessional Order 65A be omitted and the following words substituted. During question time, priority shall be given to a crossbench member seeking the call on the 5th, 13th and 17th questions. As I said, in moving urgency in the intention of the sessional orders agreed at the beginning of the 47th Parliament was to provide crossbenchers with three questions in question time. It has not worked. In five of the seven question times since the 47th Parliament began, the crossbench has only been able to ask two questions and not the agreed to three. There has been what appears to have been deliberate use of points of order to waste time in order to deny the crossbench the 21st question. Order. For members Member of the crossbench, asking silence. questions without notice is a key tool to hold government to account. Such tactical approaches to reducing the agreed number of questions is cynical and thwarts the agreement between the government, crossbench and indeed the opposition on questions. The agreement is not being treated with good faith by the opposition. This amendment is designed to restore the original intention of the sessional order. That would be in line with the numbers in the House, government, opposition, Greens and crossbench. This may seem like a small numerical change, but if we are to be truly representative, it will make a big difference for the communities that this crossbench represents. All of us on this crossbench may wish for greater reform of question time, but this is a start. I commend this motion to the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call the second uh, the member for Kuyong. Speaker, and I, I um, second the member for Goldstein's motion. As, as was, was stated, the Australian people deserve better from their parliament. They want and expect better from question time. They're disappointed with the rancour and the uselessness of many of the points of order that are raised by the opposition. They want the government to answer questions rather than asking themselves pointless questions and wasting everyone's time order. with those. We can do better and we should do better. The question is the motion be agreed to. I put the question uh, and I call the member for Indi. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Goldstein for this really important motion. Yeah, yeah. I have been here for a little bit longer um, than some of my crossbench colleagues, but I stand united with them on this issue. The people of Australia are sick of question time. It is performative politics, really, at its worst. We see mind-numbing Dorothy Dixis. We see mischievous points of order. And the people of Australia demand transparency and accountability in their parliament, and question time is one opportunity to get that, if we take it seriously. We on the crossbench do seek real answers to real questions. We are the biggest crossbench since Federation, and we undertook an agreement with these sessional orders to have proportional representation at question time. That's not being fulfilled because of many parts of this awful performative politics that is question time, not just mischievous points of order, not just mind-numbing Dorothy Dixers not just question time being cut short by the Prime Minister, all of it combined. We can make a difference in this place. We can do better. And one way of doing better is to make sure that the crossbench get their, their proportional representation at question time. I back in the member for Goldstein and I call on everyone in this parliament to do better and to support this motion. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, just hold your horses, uh, Member Petrie. The question is that the motion be agreed to and give the call to the member for Petrie. Yeah, thanks, Mr Speaker. Look, the reality is, is that it's not proportional representation. If the independents get one speaker and we, or one question and we get two every question time, the reality is, is that we have about five times as many members as them. I mean, the Greens are more, almost in coalition with Labor, so they've got 12. We've got 58. And the reality yeah. is, is that people in my seat in Petrie and right around the country expect us to be a very well accounted for opposition. And the reality is, is that if we're not getting questions, Order, the reality is, right. Mr. Speaker, is that if we're not getting questions, 
How do we hold the government to account? And the, the point is, is that I would expect better from the member for Indi and the member for Mayo and the member for Kennedy and, the, and even the member, uh, all those members that have been here for some time. Because the reality is, is that in my time in this parliament, and I've been here for four terms, three terms in government, first time in opposition, but every member that's come in here and spoken today hasn't been here before. They haven't been here when Labor has been in opposition. The points of order that they raise, the changing of standing orders, the motions moved against the government in the last few terms, they haven't been here. The member for Kuyong hasn't been here or any of, the, or any of those opposite. And so it's really not fair for Australians if we have one question from independents and then two questions more or less from the opposition. The opposition should be getting more questions than that. The Labor Party and the manager of government business shouldn't be supporting this motion. They should be making sure that the opposition gets its fair share of questions. And if they don't want to do that, the Prime Minister should should sit question time longer. And I remembered in the last term, in the 46th parliament during COVID, the member for Cook, the former prime minister, would quite often have question time going through to about, Order, 20, on my right. about 20 to four. Question time did not end at 10 past three. It went from two to 3.30, often two to 3.40, to make sure those questions were answered. So, Really, Mr Deputy Speaker, and for all Australians listening, uh, this is not good for democracy. It isn't, it isn't representational of the 151 members in this parliament. I mean, I think the Australian people know that the Greens are more or less part of the Labor Party, and that leaves 12 independents. And when I look over there, I count about maybe one or two of them that perhaps would sit with our side of, of, of the parliament. The other 10, through their contributions here today and their reflections on the opposition, really have shown their true colours today. And the, and the people of Kuyong right, and, other, and other seats, they need to be aware that their members are supporting the Labor Party and will continue to support the Labor Party and that they're not really true independents. Order. They're not. They're not. They're also not grassroots members through their language, through the way they behave and through their reflections on the opposition, wouldn't have the slightest clue of what it means to be down here with the people. I'll be really interested to see Order. how these members guys go at the right next election because objecting. the reality is, Mr Speaker, is this is not the fair. For Dunkley. It's not right. It weakens our democracy. I mean, the Prime Minister gets up and talks about the Westminster system, but he wants to change it so the opposition doesn't get its proportional representation of questions. The fact is, is they have about 20 per cent of what we have. They should be getting one in every six questions. And the government wants to support them in weakening the voices of the opposition to suit themselves, and it's just not on. Thank you. Order. 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 Members on my right, the House will come to order. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Warringah. Oh, the words um, expressed by the member for Indi. Being in my second term, I would have to, and I do support and agree with some of the statements that have been made by the opposition, as well as some of the statements made by the member for Goldstein. I would say that the spirit and intent of the cessational order 65A was on the assumption that uh, question time would go to 3.30, which it routinely did in the previous parliament, and it has been cut short in this parliament to date. It was on the, route, on the assumption that there is 22 questions in the parliament, which is, again, what often occurred in the previous parliament. The both sides of politics have, on numerous occasions, used question times to interrupt, to delay. There was suspension of standing orders during the previous parliament by the now government. There are now multiple points of order. 
The question, Mr Speaker, in the last parliament, the speakers in fact enforced that there would only be one point of order per question, and maybe that is a way which returning to a prompt uh, and then a more effective use of question time. I should say, representing a community, the community does want question time to be more effective. You are kidding yourselves if you don't think the public watches this and cares. You are, we are wasting the public's time and money when all it is is show and not a genuine questioning of government. We have now had over 100 days since the election, and we've only had this is our eighth sitting day. We are here to hold the government to account and ask serious questions. It is important, and it is important that we have proportional representation here in questions. I support the motion because we haven't been getting to proportional representation. We haven't, we are, the crossbench is 22 per cent of the opposition, and as such, there is a third question. But I would urge the government to have a proper sitting of question time to ensure that we have a full length of questions occurring. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I'll put the question. All of those of opinion say aye. Aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Oh, to lock the doors. Block the doors. The question. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will part, pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I point order. I point the honourable members for Werriwa and Bean as tellers for the ayes, and the honourable members for Gray and Parks as tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 89, noes 54. The division is carried by an absolute majority of members as required by Standing Order 47. I give the call to the Manager of Opposition Business. I seek leave to move the following motion immediately. Uh, that Standing Order 97 be amended by the addition of a new paragraph standing order 97C to read as follows. Question time must not be concluded before 3.30 p.m. each day. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Call the manager of opposition business. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders as would prevent the, uh, be suspended as would prevent the manager of opposi opposition business from moving the following motion forthwith, that Standing Order 97 be amended by the addition of a, a new paragraph, Standing Order uh, paragraph 97C, to read as follows, question time must not be concluded before 3.30 p.m. each day. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, this is demonstrably a matter of urgency. We have just had a change to the standing orders made uh, on the basis of a series of arguments put by the uh, Leader of the House and indeed by uh, the crossbench, uh, which argued that it has been the conduct of the opposition, it was said, uh, which meant that um, uh, there had been a reduction in the effective number of questions that members of the crossbench were able to ask. 
I make the point, and I do this without any criticism of the crossbench, but I make the point that the first time this was put to the opposition was at approximately 2.15 this afternoon. Uh, so there was no consultation with the opposition uh, from the crossbench. More seriously, Mr. Speaker, more seriously, there was no consultation with the opposition from the government. The, the Leader of the House made no attempt to raise this matter with me. He made no attempt to raise this matter with me. And as I've uh, explained to the House, the practical consequence of the change uh, which has just been made is that there will be a reduction in the effective number of questions which it is open to the opposition to ask every day. Standing Order uh, 65A is uh, predicated on the assumption that there will be 22 questions. But the fact is that the conduct we've seen from the government and from the Prime Minister is that uh, typically question time is being brought to an end after 20 questions or after 18 questions. Indeed, today, question time was brought to an end after 18 questions. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I emphasise that the opposition and the crossbench have a shared interest in scrutiny. We have a shared interest in accountability. The crossbench are here to represent the interests of their constituents. The opposition is here to represent the interests of our constituents. And indeed, in a Westminster system, there is a very strong interest in the government being subject to the day-to-day -day scrutiny of an informed opposition and indeed of an informed crossbench. I think we have a shared interest in as uh, much practical and effective scrutiny as there can be uh, of the government of the day. Now, if we look at what has been one of the direct causes uh, of the concern that the crossbench has raised, and I acknowledge the concern, I acknowledge the concern, which is that although Standing Order 65A, uh, drafted uh, by the government, drafted by the Leader of the House, is premised on the expectation that there will be 22 questions in question time. What we have in fact seen in practice is that question time is being ceased, uh, brought to an end by the Prime Minister after 20 questions or after 18 questions. Now, uh, as has been pointed out uh, by uh, my colleague, uh, the member for Petrie, uh, as has been pointed out by my colleague, the member for Petrie, who is a student of these matters, Mr. Speaker, is a student of these matters. All on this side of the House are students of these matters, and we have seen uh, from the uh, behaviour of the former Prime Minister, the member for Cook, a very strong commitment to question time uh, going for what, in practical terms, has been considerably longer than, regrettably, has been uh, the practice of the current Prime Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I say to you, but more importantly, I say to every member of this House. Uh, on uh, the opposition side of the House and on the crossbench side of the House, or the crossbench pit of the House. Uh, we have a shared interest in scrutiny. We have a shared interest in holding this government to account. Our constituents ask us to do that, and uh, the solution that has been put forward, the change to the standing orders that has just been made by the House, and again I, I, I must express my regret that there was not a proper opportunity for consultation with the opposition. I say, particularly the crossbench, my door is always open. Uh, our doors are open, and uh, we welcome every opportunity to sit down with you and brainstorm these issues and find a way to make our parliament work more effectively in seeking questions from government, uh, seeking answers to questions from government, and seeking to do that on behalf of the Australian people and consistent with, with what has been the historical role of oppositions throughout the Westminster system. Uh, referred to uh, for centuries as Her Majesty's loyal opposition, and of course uh, that is an important role. It is an important role in our system, and regrettably, it can sometimes be the case that prime ministers, perhaps new prime ministers, can find that scrutiny a little unappealing, a little unattractive. But it's not about uh, how people feel, whether people like it or not. It's about its importance to the system. Now, there is an urgency to this matter. Mr. Speaker, there is an urgency to this matter. The reason that standing orders should be suspended is that we have just made a change 
to the standing orders, which bears quite significantly on the operation of question time and on how effective it will be as a means of holding the government to account. And I acknowledge the concerns that have been raised uh, by the crossbench, but I also welcome comments including from, for example, the member for Warringah, who in her observations noted that she felt that some of what the opposition had said uh, had substance. And so we have in effect before us a partial solution to a clear problem. The problem we have is that the government said there would be 22 questions and the government said that there would be an allocation uh, of those questions under a certain ratio, under a certain formula, as between the opposition and the crossbench. Now, we made arguments vigorously as to whether we thought that formula or that allocation was right. But in good faith, we've worked under that allocation once it has come into effect. And it is unfortunate, I think, that this government's uh, attempt to deal with the issue, and it is a novel issue. I acknowledge, and the opposition acknowledges that it's a novel issue, but it's unfortunate that the government's attempts to deal with this issue have proved to be wanting uh, so uh, early in the life of this parliament. And it's particularly unfortunate that a key trigger of the reason why the government's attempts to deal with this issue, a key trigger for the problem here, the reason that the government's attempted solution has not worked, has been the conduct of the Prime Minister himself. And so what we have put and we put it and we say this is a matter of urgency that the House needs to consider now. What we've put is effectively the second half of the solution. Let's put two halves together and make a whole. And what we're proposing is that if one part of the solution, if one part of the solution has been a change in the uh, respective sequencing of questions being asked by the opposition and by the crossbench, uh, another part of the holistic solution here needs to be that we look at the total length of question time. Now, we've been uh, pretty reasonable in what we've proposed. Uh, we could have proposed that question time go, for example, to 4 o'clock or even to 5 o'clock, but we've proposed quite reasonably 3.30. Now, that is not without precedent at all, that question time go to uh, 3.30. Uh, that is not without precedent at all. And so, uh, Mr Speaker, I say to you and I say to the House, this matter is urgent. This matter is urgent because of the changes that uh, have just been made to the standing orders. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, the opposition was um, uh, notified of those extremely late, but uh, we put on our thinking caps, Mr Speaker. We put on our thinking caps and we've thought with alacrity and uh, with good heart. We thought with alacrity and good heart about how we can uh, come up with a holistic solution to the issue that the parliament presently uh, faces, and that holistic solution is the one embodied uh, in the motion uh, that I am now um, proposing standing orders ought be suspended, so I am able to move, and that is the motion that standing order 97 uh, would be amended by the addition of a uh, standing order 97C, uh, uh, which would say as follows, question time must not be concluded before 3:30 p.m. each day. What that would do is allow uh, a minimum, a satisfactory minimum period of time for question time to occur. Of course, we uh, would be very open to it continuing later. Should that be the government's judgment, I suspect it won't. But we'd be very open to it. Uh, but this is a practical solution, uh, which addresses both the legitimate concerns the crossbench have raised and the legitimate concerns uh, that the opposition have raised. Uh, it's unfortunate that we've seen uh, a little bit of game playing from the government. Uh, some, uh, some of those experiences from backroom Labor politics are on display today, but we're saying let's join together uh, for a kinder, gentler parliament uh, where we can work together to achieve outcomes for our constituents. Is the motion seconded. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, thank you very much. I second the motion uh, and I'll make a brief uh, contribution because we've got very important business uh, to deal with in the House. Uh, uh, two speeches that uh, we're all sitting here very anxious to, uh, to listen to, but this is an important issue that needs to be resolved before the House can move on. I want to deal with uh, a couple of points. So firstly, the, the arrangement uh, that the um, uh, honourable member spoke of, uh, the amendment to the standing orders, essentially in this parliament uh, reduced the numbers from 10 to 8 for questions that the opposition could put to the government. Now that was quite a departure 
from practice uh, over many, many parliaments. It was driven uh, by the inclusion of uh, the, uh, the crossbench uh, members, and, and I acknowledge that. Uh, that's fine. There is nothing to this argument about uh, proportionality, though, is the first point, uh, Mr yeah. Speaker. The member for Petrie uh, rightly pointed out that uh, the numbers here uh, in the opposition number 58, and that is uh, roughly five times the numbers uh, within the crossbench. So th th there's nothing to that argument. It's a facilitation of the crossbench, and the government came to an agreement uh, at about the same time that they cut all their staff, of course, uh, that they would have uh, an arrangement in place where the crossbenchers could ask questions. Now, um, we're, we're in support of that, uh, and we've, we've made that point clear today. But the reality, Mr Speaker, is that we now move beyond that to uh, a point that wasn't contemplated initially, and that is to reduce, in effect, from eight down to seven questions, the number that the opposition can put to uh, the government of the day. Now, if this was an above board action, if this was something that the government was proud of, if this was something that, in concert with the crossbenchers, was done transparently, if we had have been advised of this cosy arrangement before question time, not during question time, uh, then that would have been a different scenario. There may have been some legitimacy to what's being argued here, Mr Speaker, but that's not what's being argued. The argument around there somehow being a conspiracy by the opposition to pad out question time so that those members on the crossbench couldn't achieve their third question. I'll just deal with that. It is a complete nonsense. Now, I've met in good faith with each of the members of the crossbench. I extended to them an opportunity to speak on issues that were important to them. Not one of them has taken up the opportunity to raise this issue with me. Because, Mr Speaker, it is not a legitimate criticism. We haven't raised points of order here to try and exclude their opportunity to ask another question of the government. What interest would we have in that, Mr Speaker? We're happy for questions to be asked of the government. We think they're a bad government. And whether it's us or whether it's the Greens or the Independents asking questions of the government, I'm fine with all of that. So to somehow suggest that the legitimacy, which is the point that the member for Goldstein made, that somehow the legitimacy to her point here and her secret agreement with the government is to try and deal with an issue of our making is a complete nonsense. And I'm not going to stand for it. I'm not going to be besmirched in that way, Mr Speaker, because it is not genuine. And if it was a genuine concern that the member for Goldstein or indeed the member for Kuyong had, they would have come to see me. They would have raised this because I've said to them that I have an open door in relation to any issues that they have. Not a peep. Not a peep. So when we hear about transparency and we hear about uh, a new conduct and a new parliament a new way of behaving and a new way of conducting yourself. That's not been on display here today, Mr Speaker. And we've seen a government that saw this coming. I mean, to the manager of uh, government business, he's an experienced hand. He saw them coming a mile away. And what did they come with? They came with an argument that we would be able to, as an opposition, ask one less question of the government. Why wouldn't they take it up? Why wouldn't they take it up, Mr Speaker? Now, what happens in the circumstance where, as today, there was a condolence motion at the beginning of question time? Now, to the government's credit today, it extended beyond 3.10 to accommodate the time that was taken for the condolence motion in relation to, uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, that was an appropriate extension today, but that is not anything other than a discretion exercised or not by the government of the day. That hasn't been accommodated for in the honourable members uh, from the crossbench in their proposition today. Yeah. There's nothing in the standing order that says that the government must extend when a proper condolence motion is considered by this House, question time beyond 3.10, which would be the appropriate way to do it. So I think there is a lot of reflection to take place here. Now, the government's not going to allow this motion to get up. They'll seek to close it down. Um, but I think, Mr Speaker, it is very poor, a very poor reflection on those members who have contributed in a way and misrepresented what this today is really about. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for uh, the Leader of the House. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition has accurately predicted what I'm about to say. Uh, let me first of all, though, deal with uh, some, of the, some of the comments, though, that have been made on the way through. Um, First, the, the comment about us not allowing debate. Uh, 
former coalition government during its time in office gag debate 654 times. In this exact sort of motion, the two speeches that have just been heard never would have been heard. Never. Not a chance. Would not have happened. 654 times. 654 times. But, but allow me, allow me, because the leader, we just Are you have... taking a point of order? All right. The Leader of the House will, will resume his seat. And I call the Leader of the Opposition. Certainly, Mr Speaker, I rise to make the point of order that that statement made by the Minister is completely inaccurate. It is false. He has misled the parliament and he should correct the record now at the first available the opportunity. I call the Leader of the House. That the question be put. Votes 272 times under the former coalition government. That the member be no further heard. 382 times under the former coalition government. And where the Leader of the Opposition just referred to you know, the, the mathematics and numbers not being true, can I just draw his attention to this? He said that the numbers of the Opposition were five times those of the crossbench. Because the, there are 16 on the crossbench. If you multiply it by five, that means you're in government. It means you've got 80 members in the House. That's what they've just said. That's just what they've said. There are 16 on the crossbench. And the proportionality, the proportionality, that the, the proportionality that's reflected in the sessional order does presume we should get to 22 questions. I would simply warn, I would simply warn those considering this motion about one of the impacts that will definitely come from what the manager of opposition business has moved. Effectively, if part of what the House just voted on was to have an incentive that we don't spend as much time on endless points of order, what this is about doing is about saying, well, push off the finish time and then the opposition can keep behaving exactly as they have with absolutely nothing to provide any extra layer of discipline. That, that's what they're suggesting. So, if those opposite, if those opposite on the, I know I, I speak to the members of the crossbench here directly in terms of the concept of how often, how long does question time normally go for? Can I just refer to page 554 of practice? Since 2011, the first complete year of the 43rd Parliament, following the introduction of restrictions on duration of questions and answers, it has been about 70 minutes. That's the normal length of time for question time. The Leader, the leader of the Opposition is right, though. It's right and proper that there be extensions whenever possible at the end when there's been significant indulgences at the start. That is something that should happen. But the 70-minute concept really simply has the impact that you get 11 questions each side, because some, some questions are a bit shorter, some answers are a bit shorter. History has been you get 11 questions each side if you don't stall the whole day with points of order. So here's what changes as a result of what the opposition have put. Either way now, we get a situation where if the opposition wants to get all 11 questions, it's on them to only raise points of order that are genuine points of order. If we do the extension, then what we saw today, what we saw the previous days that this parliament has sat, where you get four points of order in the course of a single question, where it goes on and on and on. If this motion is carried, that will be continued. I don't think that's consistent with the aspirations that people have for this parliament, and I'd urge people to vote against it. The question is that the motion be disagreed to. I put the question. All those of opinion say aye. Aye. Against noes. No. I think the ayes have it. Those have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
block the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Werriwa and Bean as tellers for the ayes and the honourable members for Gray and Parks as tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 73, noes 70. The requirements of Standing Order 47C for an absolute majority having not been satisfied, the motion was not carried.